And welcome back to another episode of this reading and discussion diving through Sean McMeekin's book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Joining me today is Mr. Nicholas Sorokin. How are you, sir? I am doing quite well this evening. Prude, how are you? I'm doing great. Uh, happy to continue on with the series and the book. Um, so we are continuing on. We are on... Um, we just finished Gangster Pact Part 1. We sort of discussed the invasion of Poland and the division and really the partition of Poland during the Second World War. Now we are on um, the Gangster Pact Part 2, uh, discussing Finland. And we'll just get right into it. <clears throat> All right. While Ribbentrop, because of Hitler's haste, had been flexible on the fine print of the Moscow Pact and the Soviet-German Treaty of Friendship, cooperation and demarcation, Molotov and Stalin had been meticulous with their own territorial claims. By insisting on Soviet predominance in Finland and the Baltic states, now including Lithuania too, Stalin could not only recover Russia's old czarist borders in the northwest, but also acquire naval bases to project Soviet power further into the Baltic Sea, whence came numerous stores vital to Hitler's war effort, from Swedish iron ore and timber to Finnish nickel. Compounding the economic leverage Stalin enjoyed over his partner in Berlin, owing to Hitler's need for Soviet oil, manganese, cotton, and grain, as well as rubber trans shipments from Asia, Soviet domination of the Baltic would turn Nazi Germany into a virtual economic vassal of the Soviet Union, with the Wehrmacht's every forward movement dependent on Stalin's goodwill. With his keen grasp of geopolitics, Churchill had hinted at this German vulnerability in the war cabinet, Drawing from, it, drawing from it the strategically plausible, if morally questionable, conclusion that Britain should, therefore, encourage Soviet aggression against Russia's Baltic neighbors. The one thing Stalin had not reckoned on was that any of these neighbors might object. Certainly, he did not expect resistance from the Baltic states. As early as September 24, 1939, Molotov had advised the Estonian foreign minister, Karl Selter, to yield to the wishes of the Soviet Union in order to avoid something worse, end quote. The next day, Selter was informed that those wishes amounted to a mutual assistance pact, allowing the Soviets to establish military bases on Estonian soil. When Selter pointed out that such a pact was incompatible with a non-aggression treaty Estonia had signed with Germany in June, Molotov replied, I can assure you that Germany will give her consent. If you wish, I can procure this consent, end quote. Selter returned to Tallinn to feel out the German minister, only to discover to his horror that Molotov was right about the Germans. After Selter returned to Moscow on September 27th, Stalin stepped in to finish him off. Citing a spurious provocation having to do with a Polish submarine that had, quote, escaped from Tallinn Harbor and allegedly sunk a Soviet merchant ship, the Vots demanded the right to station 25,000 Red Army troops in Estonia, a Soviet army base in Tallinn, naval bases in Paldiski, and on the Estonian islands of Sarar Saramea and Huama, to build a number of Soviet aerodromes in the country. Were this not all granted, Stalin warned, es Estonia would endure what happened to Poland. Where is Poland now? With Soviet yeah, troops... You, uh, in... Go ahead. You almost have to admire the uh, the frankness of Stalin here. It's like, it's very, it's almost media villainish, just how uh, how straightforward it is. You know, do this or you're next. You don't see, uh, you don't see any sort of uh, euphemisms or anything like that. It's very direct, which is, in a certain way, refreshing. Yeah, we had... Uh... We had, we had, I guess, competent or uh, we had bad guys with a flair for the theatric, whereas nowadays yes. you get Klaus Schwab dressed like a Bond villain. Um, yeah. I, I think about yeah. that theater kid occupied government thing all the time. Um, it is so true. <laughs> a flair for the dramatic isn't. Uh, whereas now it's just like, hey, where's Poland? Oh, that's right. Poland doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Continue on. <laughs> With Soviet troops and tanks massing on the Estonian border to make good on Stalin's threat, Selter was forced to sign the treaty at midnight of September 28, 1939. Latvia was next in line. After witnessing the humiliation of his Estonian counterpart, Latvia's foreign minister, Wilhelm Munters, could have no illusions about what lay in store when he was summoned to the Kremlin on October 2, 1939. 
Nonetheless, Munters must have been shaken by Molotov's threat that he would not be allowed to leave Moscow until he signed an agreement. Hold hostages uh, within Russia. The unfortunate foreign minister was further jolted by Stalin, Stalin's jocular tone when the vote supposed to... I tell you frankly, a division of spheres of interest has already taken place. As far as Germany is concerned, we can occupy you, end quote. This Stalin proposed to do 30,000 troops. He also demanded four aerodromes on Latvian territory, along with Soviet naval bases in the port cities of Lebao, Bindau, and uh, Pitrags. He got them. Lithuania, Stalin's newest prize and most strategically located, it made up the borderland between the new borderland between Nazi Germany and the Sovietized Baltic region, would be flattened with the largest occupying force of 50,000 Red Army troops. When informed of this, Lithuania's foreign minister, Josas Urbis, objected to such an occupation, would reduce Lithuania to a vassal state. Stalin replied brutally, you talk too much. Still, Urbsis, like his Estonian and Latvian counterparts, held firm enough to barter Stalin down from his initial demand for a dozen Soviet army bases on Lithuanian territory to four. Urbsis also secured a transfer of the disputed province of Vilna, or Vilnius, or what the Soviets called the Valensky Corridor, to Lithuania from what had been eastern Poland, with the Soviet recognition fixed for 15 years. Of course, it may have been that, as Urbsis suspected, Stalin agreed to this only because he planned to incorporate all of Lithuania into the Soviet Union eventually. For the time being, though, it was Lithuania, not the Soviet Union, that incurred the odium of Poland's government in exile, which launched protests against the Lithuanian annexation in London. Once more, Soviet troops amassed on the border to press the point. On October 10th, Urbsis signed, and Lithuania became Stalin's newest satellite. Uh... Troops on the border. Uh, I'm sure uh, um, perhaps a more progressive or a more uh, modern reading of this might make one remind themselves of right before um, Feb the end of February of 2022. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, there is. Uh, I think especially with uh, some of the things mentioned in uh, the initial parts of the Finnish invasion in this chapter, I I'm sure there were Redditors aplenty that were uh, soy facing about how this is just like February 2022, complete with, you know, saying alleged problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wonder how many progressives actually have read this book. Mm. Probably not many. No, uh, no, not too many. Uh, outside of, say, some critical readings for collegiate essays or something like that. But, I mean, no, uh, what we're, we're seeing here and yeah. what Throughout the, the the series so far, we have we have underlined you know several key factors. One is is that you want to see a, a re expansion of old Russian borders from yes. you know czarist Russia to now the new Soviet um, state. We need to maintain that any aggression from Nazi Germany can be contained by having satrapies and vassal states that hold key economic resources. So you have the economic keys to um, Hitler's war machine, and then on top of that, you know. I have millions of people I can throw at you, or in this case, yes. you know, tens of thousands. But I mean, you, 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 we do see a lot of sort of revisionist World War II history where sort of the the ethnic bias will in, and it's just like, well, you know, you really are just fighting hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of of, of Slavic and Asiatic soldiers from across <laughs> Russia's vast territory, and this is the kind of power you can flex with it. I mean, this really does reemphasize the structural realist or the neo-realist perception of holding territory you need manpower to do it and if you don't have yep. the manpower you can't do it and the soviet yeah, union yeah. that was their best strength absolutely yeah it was uh and it did in a certain respect of you know the uh the late russian empire as well they they did have a lot of people yeah yes but yeah yeah there's yeah a lot of provisionism as you say here uh very and you know it's not haphazard either right? which i think goes without saying like these are you know these are very strategically minded territorial aims it's not just oh i'm going to grab territory just because yeah and i think we'll get yeah. a map later in this chapter that yes. will highlight just how important these areas are to the soviets always important for us americans is remind us what europe looks like yes uh after all um mark twain was absolutely right uh you know, God invented war so Americans could learn geography. Yep. Wasting little time, the next day Stalin signed a sweeping order, number 001223, authorizing the deportation of anti-Soviet elements from Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. 
Although this was not a standing order, valid and although this was a standing order, valid indefinitely, in practice, only a small number of Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians were rounded up on a, in October 1939. Stalin's more urgent goal, judging from a series of Politburo resolutions over the coming weeks, was to track down Polish officers who had fled to the Baltic states. In an early November report, two NKVD divisions, 12,824 agents, were assigned to a, a blanket the railways and rail stations in districts bordering German Poland in a great manhunt for Polish officers and elites who had escaped Stalin's clutches so far. For now, rounding up renegade Poles remained a higher priority for Stalin than punishing Baltic people. Stalin had also designs on Finland, which had even greater strategic importance for Russia than the Baltic states. Finland's southern borders crept dangerously close to Leningrad, formerly Petrograd and St. Petersburg, the birthplace of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and Russia's former capital. At one point, the frontier ran only 20 miles from the city outskirts to the flat plains of the Carolian Isthmus, a distance easily covered in hours by infantry, an hour by motorized divisions, or in mere minutes by warplanes. Finland's southern coastline also dominated the Baltic Sea and the Gulf of Finland approaches to Leningrad. The Russian Imperial Navy had once placed its headquarters in the Finnish port of Helsinki, while Finland, a tiny population of scarcely 3.5 million people, was not much larger than Lithuania's 2.9 million, could have hardly threatened the Soviet colossus, and had fought fiercely for independence during the Russian Civil War, conquering Helsinki in April 1918, and dealing the Reds a series of painful blows. The Finnish White Guards, as the Bolsheviks referred to the forces commanded by the redoubtable Gustav Mannerheim, had also, Stalin remembered, worked with German troops and collaborated with the British Baltic Fleet. Had Mannerheim's connections with the Germans not been so strong, the British might have lent his Finnish guards more support in the critical days of fall 1919, when Petrograd nearly fell to the Whites. All this was a small consolation to Stalin, who mostly remembered the humiliation of losing Finland and the Finnish double dealing with outside powers. The fear that Finland might once again invite a power hostile to the Soviet Union, whether Britain or Germany, was never far from Stalin's mind. Yeah, so, you know, this, it's uh, yeah. uh, McMeekin only mentions it offhand and doesn't focus much on it, but... Uh, from what we read afterwards, I think that uh, that personal humiliation and memory of the Finnish victory uh, actually affected Stalin's decision-making process here quite a bit with regards to Finland. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the same thing or not. Feel free to correct me. But uh, because if you look at how he uh, how he dealt with Finland, it's uh, it's very much sort of brute force, blunt instrument where he just kind of pulls them up to the negotiation table, makes some demands, and is rather surprised and taken aback when they say no. Like, it's, uh, compare this to how Stalin was with, uh, with Nazi Germany or with America, where he had, you know, Hitler and Ribbentrop effectively wrapped around his finger and he was meticulously going through all these negotiations, or with FTR, where, you know, the, U the USSR went from owing the U.S. money to securing quite a few very favorable loans and technology transfers from the U.S. to the USSR, right? You don't see any of that delicacy here. Oh, yeah, absolutely not. And I mean, there are very little resources in this in English. And um, Charles Haywood, a great book reviewer, my favorite Doomer optimist and, and Fed poster, he had uh, discussed this in a series of books that he reviewed on the Finnish Civil War, which really is sort of this Finnish War for Independence, right. where you are seeing the... Bolshevism did not succeed in Finland. Finland manages to break from the former Tsarist territory. And, you know, they, they have a staunch anti-Russian position and still do to this day. And yep. um, that's definitely going to inform the sort of cultural uh, as well as sort of that personal vendetta that we see here. Um, you know, when you have an ideology that is so all encompassing, it is it is killed, killed the church, killed, you know, priests, killed the wealthy, killed the middle class. Uh, and has starved and killed millions more, you know, someone that's managed to, to poke your eye with a stick is definitely on the list of people you want to take out first. And I think that oh. that does definitely play a huge role, like you were saying, yeah. into Stalin's calculus here, and it shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, like I said, like there is, uh, it's the uh, lead up to the invasion of Finland, as we can see, it's very rushed. Many things are skipped over, mistakes are made. And again, I, I, I think we, you can't underestimate just the, uh, 
like the personal vendetta in that aspect. Like McMeekin touches on it a little, but I yeah, I think it is definitely worth mentioning. Absolutely. But we'll carry on. Yes. It was to counter this threat that Stalin had sent his special envoy, Boris Yartsev, to Helsinki in April 1938. The scenario Yartsev proposed to the Finns was that a hostile Germany might use Finland as a springboard to invade Russia, or that Hitler's agents might install a pro-Nazi government in Helsinki that would invade the Soviet Union. Not unnaturally, Yartsev's demand for Soviet basing rights struck Finnish leaders as a violation of Finland's sovereignty. After these proposals were rejected, Stalin's envoy demanded positive guarantees that Finland would not allow German troops in case of war between Germany and the Soviet Union. This, excuse me, this demand too was turned down, along with the new Soviet request lodged by Stalin's NKVD man in March 1939 for a 30-year Soviet lease on Sorsari, and four smaller islands in the Gulf of Finland. Not surprised there. Nope. Not surprised in the slightest. Um, uh, although, you know, of course, we're, we're going to see the, the, the soviet Finnish war, the Winter War play out, but um, we, 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 do get the, we do get the Nazis, of course, in Norway, you know, just neighboring right up there in Scandinavia. Yep. Uh the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact altered the strategic equation. Wherever Germany's sympathies might have lain, it looked as it had looked the other way as Stalin bullied the tiny Baltic states. This suggested that Hitler might leave Finland in the lurch too, despite the role played by German troops liberating Finland from communist rule in 1918 and the popularity of the Finnish national cause in Germany. Although Finland's leaders had no knowledge of the secret protocols assigning their country to Stalin's sphere of influence, they may have suspected what lay in store when Molotov summoned a Finnish delegation to the Kremlin on October 12, 1939. Once again, Stalin made a personal appearance to heighten the intimidation factor, and he had handed the Finns a brutal ultimatum demanding that the frontier between Russia and Finland and the Karlian Isthmus region be moved westward to a point only 20 miles east of Ipiri which all existing fortifications in the Karlian Isthmus be destroyed, and the Finns cede Russia, the islands of Susari, Lavansari, and Tiatsari, and Kovisto in the Gulf of Finland, along with most of the Rybaki Peninsula on the Arctic coast. Stalin's ultimatum also insisted on a lease of the peninsula of Hanko protruding from outward from Finland's Baltic coast west of Helsinki, and that Finland permit the Soviets to establish a base there, manned by 5,000 troops and some support units. In exchange for these, these are some pretty, I mean, small numbers in comparison to the entire size of the Soviet force that's deployed in the Second World War, but still, these are some pretty damning territorial concessions. Yes, yes, especially since we'll see on the map in a couple of pages, these are all very close to uh, the capital, Helsinki, and they're also very, they're the most strategically important parts of Finnish territory, which means they're also most of Finland's bargaining chips for their own sovereignty. So by giving these up, you're effectively asking Finland to give up any de facto status it has as a sovereign state. Yeah, absolutely. And and we the the idea of a rump state is not new to us in respects to um you know foreign policy or even yes. the discussion about Ukraine as a is a rump state if the, the mm -hmm. Russians are to get their way now. Yes. In exchange for these concessions, Stalin offered Soviet land in eastern Karelia. There the Soviet interior was already guarded by Lake Ladoga. Uh, the territory Stalin was offering comprised of 5,500 square kilometers, nearly twice as large as the land he was demanding, about 2,700 square kilometers. And yet the difference in strategic importance was plain. Eastern Karelia was mostly uninhabited marshland and swamps. The Western Karelian Isthmus, where Stalin's claims were forced, guarded the approaches to Leningrad and was an invasion highway to Vipuri or Vyborg and Helsinki. Likewise, a Sovietized Hanko would threaten Helsinki from the other direction, shifting the frontier from Leningrad towards Helsinki and turning over Hanko and the islands. Stalin made clear was the price that Finland had to uh, pay to avoid the fate of Poland, which is virtually the same thing. Um, give up your sovereignty either way. Yeah, yeah. You can you can do it without blood, or you can just do it by surrendering territorial integrity. Yep. Yeah. Not, not much to add there. All very yeah. true. 
Aggressive and insulting as the Soviet demands on Finland were, Stalin and Molotov fully expected them to be accepted. As the Ukrainian party boss and the future general secretary Nikita Khrushchev later recalled, the mood in the Politburo at that time was that all we had to do was raise our voice a little bit and the Finns would obey. If that didn't work, we could fire one shot and the Finns would put up their hands and surrender. Stalin ruled, after all, a heavily armed empire of more than 170 million that had been in a state of near constant mobilization since early September, and that had the recent campaign experience in Poland, even if it wasn't a haphazard mop up operation. In armor, the order of battle was almost absurdly lopsided. Well into the second five-year plan of Stalin's armament drive, the Red Army had already deployed 21,000 modern tanks, while the tiny Finnish army did not possess an anti-tank gun, although it would acquire 37mm Bofors anti-tank guns from Sweden before the war broke out. Most of these Soviet tanks were light T-26 models, but hundreds of them had been outfitted with a compressed air operated thrower designed to spray poisonous chemicals, gases, or burning liquids. The Finnish Air Force had maybe a dozen fighter planes facing a Red Air Armada of 15,000, with 10,362 brand new warplanes built in 1939 alone. And I must reiterate to our listeners, if you are just starting in with this series, I highly recommend that you listen to the others, but so much of American um, technology and American expertise was spied on or just openly given to the Soviets. Yes. They like the, the most famous Soviet air designers, the ones where they still name aircraft after them today, you know, uh, two eleven and others in Sukhoi all got their knowledge by having agents visiting American aeronautical plants, engineering classes and getting technical data from the Americans, whether through spying or outright visiting them during the 1920s and thirties. Um, it yes, cannot sir. be understated how much of an impact America had willingly and unwillingly uh, in making the Soviet war machine what it was then and to some extent what the Russian war machine is today. Yeah, yeah to some extent. Yeah, nor can it be underestimated uh, you know, just, uh, just how willing an accomplice FDR was to this. The uh, Calling it naivete is being extremely charitable to FDR, as you've said before. Yeah, at a certain point, you can't call it naivete or or unwittingness. This is outright, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, just being Treason. open, tre treasonous, openly complicit, uh, <laughs> being a Judas Iscariot to the United States yeah. of America and to the Western European world. Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, the only reason I wouldn't believe he was a Soviet agent is because the Soviets themselves are surprised at just how accommodating he was being. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we have, and, and, and McMeekin will go through this throughout the book where he's talking about the Soviet records and the archives that are finally accessible to a lot of Western scholars. And yeah, they're just like, FDR was just like, yeah, sure. You know, uh, which again, uh, there's the, the Polish author, Rizard Ludgutko, who had wrote um, a few years back called The Demon and Democracy, where he asks the question, you know, where, why didn't we punish any commies after the Cold War fell? How come we didn't uh, hang any communists? Well, it turns out communists make really good social democrats and progressive liberals. Yes. It cannot be understated. Yeah. Finnish artillery dated to the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. The Finnish army had a few 1914-era water-cooled heavy machine guns, a few light machine guns, the 23-pound Lati or Salaranta, and handheld submachine guns, machine pistols known as the Sumoi. The Finnish Army Reserve still mostly drilled with wooden rifles dating to the 19th century. By contrast, the Red Army was, in November 1939, the largest in the world, the most mechanized, the most heavily armored, and the most lavishly armed, even if surely not because of Stalin's purges, the best led. This is what you're up against. And uh, again, you just heard the most mechanized, heavily armored, and heavily armed in the uh, in the world, and a big part of that is due to American uh, guns and expertise. Yep. One can imagine, therefore, Stalin's shock when the Finns said no. Surely they were joking. As Stalin pointed out, he was offering more land than he was demanding. Would any other great power do that? When the Finns demanded to know why the Russians were insisting on Hanko and the Finland's Baltic Islands, Stalin's replied the mouth of the Finnish Gulf must be closed to prevent any nation from entering there. 
and who the Finnish envoy, in envoy asked would attack Russia. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, or no, Stalin said it might be either Germany or England. Still hopeful for an easy win, Stalin offered a six-day extension. We'll sign an agreement on October 20th, Molotov proposed, and the following evening, we'll throw a party for you. Showing impressive stubbornness, the Finnish delegation returned to Moscow only on October 23rd, three days after the Molotov deadline. This time, the Finnish government dispatched the higher-ranking Banyo Tanner, shortly to be named foreign minister. Over the preceding week, Finnish diplomats had canvassed, among, canvassed opinion among Finland's Scandinavian neighbors and Western powers. Remarkably, although not a single country had offered to intervene on Finland's behalf if it came to blows with the Soviet colossus, the Finnish answer to Stalin's ultimatum remained a firm no. It is, is it your intention to provoke a conflict, Molotov asked, only for Tanner to reply, we want no such thing, but you seem to. The only concession Molotov and Stalin made was to reduce the proposed Soviet occupation garrison at Hanko from 5,000 to 4,000. For the Finns, this was a non-starter. Hanko was so close to Helsinki that giving it up would amount to surrender of sovereignty. With remarkable bravery, the Finns refused Stalin's terms once again. Uh, the, the balls on this guy. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, they did win uh, one civil war against the Soviets. It stands to reason they might be able to do it again. Indeed. But again, uh, you know, we're, we're given the stakes, of course, in history yes, 2020. Yes. But I mean, you know, this is good on them. Good on them. Absolutely. Stunned by this unexpected resistance, Stalin and Matov did not, at first, know quite what to do. On the bright side, the timetable for opportunistic Soviet expansion no longer seemed as pressing as it had back in late September and the first days of October 1939, when the Baltic states had been bullied into submission. Excuse me. On October 6th, Hitler had given an address to the Reichstag, announcing victory over Poland and offering Britain a peace settlement that would include German acceptance of Polish statehood, though sharply truncated. The Führer had also warned sharply that if Chamberlain's government refused his terms and continued the war, the conflict would lead to the destruction of the British Empire. Nevertheless, Hitler's Reichstag speech had raised the hopes of many Europeans that peace was in sight and the corresponding fears in Moscow— that the window of opportunity for communist expansion might now be closing. In his diary, Neville Chamberlain conceded that Hitler made a very attractive series of proposals and that his tone had been surprisingly friendly to Great Britain. In public, however, Chamberlain defiantly rejected Hitler's peace offer feeler or peace feeler on October 12th and declared that the German government and the German government alone stands in the way of peace. Yeah. So, yeah, I actually did have that section highlighted. I, uh, I don't know too much about uh, Chamberlain and his tenure uh, in the office of prime minister, but seeing that, I have to wonder if there was any kind of under the table, you know, dealings or offers that were made that caused uh, Chamberlain, Chamberlain's public appearance to uh, waver from his private thoughts like that. If uh, I'm not sure if you know anything on that subject. Well, I would imagine, of course, that you have the. Uh the more boisterous and hawkish concerns that would later come from Churchill inside of his own right, government right. at this time. Of course, he's in the cabinet. Um, and that, of course, you know, you, you have to stand in opposition. I, I, I don't have enough historical knowledge specifically on, on Neville Chamberlain to sort of back this up, but I do see that Chamberlain is, is walking a very fine line on how to maintain his government between either losing it to labor, but more importantly, losing it to a far more hawkish um, conservative Tory, you know, liberal coalition. Right. Yeah, that that is fair enough, because I know, I mean, I don't know very much about Chamberlain, but I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the uh, the duration of him in mainstream history as, you know, a weakling who failed to stand up to a bully or what have you really isn't accurate. Like he was Chamberlain knew perfectly well what he was doing, and he was trying to de-escalate what he saw would be a global conflict that could well spell the end of the British Empire, as it indeed did. Absolutely. And we, we have the source right here, for those that are interested, cited in H. Montgomery Hyde's Neville Chamberlain. In his new Hitler, Brendan Sims observes on page 356 that Hitler's peace offering was sincerely meant, according to Chamberlain, and then argues later on page 359 that Chamberlain's refusal to compromise had far-reaching consequences. And that it certainly did. 
who knows what mm-hmm. the war would have been like if there would have been the war that we know. Yes. Despite the welcome news that the European war would go on, ensuring more opportunities for Soviet expansion, Stalin would have to tread more carefully in Finland, lest he risk awakening the ghost of British anti-communism from its long slumber. Chamberlain and Halifax may have declined to back Finland, and Churchill might have proposed conceding the entire Baltic region to the Soviet sphere as a counterweight to Germany, but there were still hardliners in the British Foreign Office. The British ambassador to Finland, Thomas Snow, how very fitting of a name, was a fire-breathing anti-communist who did his best to remind Whitehall, as the British Army, mo- as the Red Army mobilized on the Finnish frontier, that Stalin was just as much of an aggressor as Hitler was. It's always, uh, I've said this in previous episodes, but I mean, it's always these older diplomats that are, you know, that already have decades of service that are just like, what are you doing? Are yeah. you stupid? You, what? <laughs> There are two devils that you're fighting here, you know? And one of yeah. them is a, is a little worse than the other. Uh, yeah, you know, but, you know, if you're, a, if you're a Western libtard and you made a deal with one of those devils to take out uh, an industrial adversary, you might turn a blind eye. Many, many such cases. Yep. <sighs> the British amb- ambassador in Moscow, Sir William Seeds was less firm in his political conviction, but he was no Joseph Davies-style appeaser either. Seeds was cool enough towards Stalin that he has been blamed by some diplomatic historians for the failure of British-French-Soviet alliance talks in the summer of 1939, in parentheses, he says, unfairly in the light of materials now available from the Soviet archives, in parentheses. The first secretary of Britain's Moscow embassy, John Le Roquetel, was a man in Thomas Snow's line, These diplomats were Chamberlain's appointees, and they shared their prime minister's wariness of Stalin. Even Churchill, despite his recent remarks that advocating that the Baltic might become a Soviet sphere of influence, was known to Stalin as a devoted anti-communist from the Russian Civil War days, when indeed he had been one. And uh, Sir William Seeds on C. Sidney Astor, the diplomat as scapegoat, leadership and responsibility in the Second World War, um, with uh, Brian Pader Federal and Robert Vogel and such. But yeah, I mean, really does illustrate um, there's a lot of British anti-communist action during the, the 19, the rest, the end of the 1910s, but also the uh, 1920s as well. But this gets eventually pacified by Soviet infiltration. Yep. Yeah, and domestic labor as well, but yeah. Yeah, well, again, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Six of one, half dozen of the other. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, all it's it's that old problem where it's just like, you know, huh, how 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 much of a difference really is there between communism and these 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 libtards? Um, not much. Not yeah. much. The solution is the same either way. Yes, yes. <laughs> it it really is. Um so when you when you see people on Twitter like Gove Fianon say like the communists won World War II, like it doesn't matter if the communists lose on paper. Um the the ideological end game is still the goal. Yep. Yeah, they wanted world revolution, and they did get it. They sure did. Um, and that world revolution is suicidal ideation uh, on a civilizational scale. Yes. With his highly placed spies in London, Stalin must have known that the mood was becoming agitated by Soviet moves in the Baltic region. On October 31st, 1939, the British War Cabinet took up the question of Soviet aggression against Finland or other Scandinavian countries. The subtext was that British Britain's reputation had been compromised by the hypocrisy of its refusal to stand up to the Soviet aggression in Poland. Most neutral states, British Britain's chiefs of staff concluded excuse me, regard the spread of Bolshevism as worse than Hitlerism, against which we have set our face. There is, therefore, some danger that if we fail to stand up to Russia, we may lose the sympathy of the neutral states to an extent which may have dangerous military implications. It had not escaped Whitehall's notice that the U.S. President Roosevelt had written a letter to the President of the Soviet Union, M.I. Kalinin, on October 12th, demanding clarification of the Soviet posture on Finland in a language alarming enough that Molotov had composed a reply in Kalinin's name on October 15th, reassuring Roosevelt carefully that talks underway in Moscow had no aim other than improving mutual relations between the Soviet Union and Finland. Molotov was less diplomatic in his speech to the Supreme Soviet on October 31st when he declared it was hard to reconcile America's meddling in these questions with her profession of neutrality. 
Yeah. Well, that's uh, somewhat of a perennial tale now in U.S. foreign policy. Indeed. Um, although it is interesting to to say to see the British chiefs of staff conclude that Bolshevism is worse than Hitlerism. Um, ba- based on how listened. you, st- yeah, would have listened. Well, I mean, based on how we we portray the Second World War, whether it's like that movie Darkest Days or anything about this, you would think that the war is just entirely Germany. You know, oh yeah, it, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's only Hitler's Germany that's the real problem. Despite the fact that Bolshevism has killed more than Hitlerism ever did, and but again, you know, when there's just a, a half a degree of separation or just a just some rough edges that divide sort of modern progressive historiography from Soviet, you know, communist yeah. Bolshevist historiography. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, even to this day, like you know, if you uh, you go to into any history classroom and you read about the Russian Revolution, you know, chances are you dig back far enough, the sources you are reading from that describe, you know, just how horrible and totalitarian the Russian Empire was are just Soviet sources. We're just uh, the, the uh, you know, libtard American British education system just pulled Soviet sources on the Russian Revolution and just rolled with it because it was politically convenient at that time and nothing has changed to this day. Yeah. And again, I mean, the the threat of Bolshevism was not contained uh, in, in nope. the conclusion of the Second World War, and uh, we we see that play out right here. It was true that intervening against the Soviet Union if Stalin invaded hit, uh, Finland would expand the war and strain Britain's stretched military resources. But if Britain took a stand and the Americans joined the Allied cause, the British chiefs of staff predicted, there is no doubt that the open support of the United States would decide the attitude of Japan and probably also of Italy and Spain. The resulting accretion of our military strength would far outweigh the additional commitments we should undertake in going to war with Russia. Here was a flash of strategic insight. The Finnish cause had the potential to transform the so far- dulcetory and hypocritical British-French resistance to Hitler alone into a principled war against armed aggression by both totalitarian regimes. It therefore could remake the strategic landscape, even turning fascist Italy, Franco-Spain, and Japan into Western allies, while bringing the huge weight of the United States onto allied scales, if not as a full belligerent, then perhaps with financial support and arms deliveries. But rather than pursuing this intriguing line of thought, the war cabinet changed the subject. To avoid assuming additional military burdens, it was resolved that Britain and France should go to war against Stalin only if the Soviet Union invaded Finland and Sweden too, despite there being no evidence of Soviet intention to do so. And so the idea of a grand alliance against the totalitarian dictatorships of Hitler and Stalin was still born for now. Yeah, that's... Could you, uh... just, can you only imagine? Could you imagine... What... What the uh, the uh, the the wholesome Chungus alliance of uh, Francoist Spain, uh, Britain, and fascist Italy against Hitler and Stalin, and you... would have been one hell of a timeline. I would have taken that timeline. Oh no, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I would, would, I would have taken too. that. I, I'll take those odds. Yes, yeah, one hundred percent. Although it is, yeah, I think this passage also uh, uh, we're, sees some of the, uh, I guess. Limits, I suppose you'd call it, of McMeekin's analysis, where he mentions this kind of thing more than once in earlier chapters, like sort of like the hypocrisy of Western leaders with regards to, uh, you know, Germany and uh, Russia, or sorry, Soviet Union, where, you know, Hitler is condemned, but not Stalin. And why can't we treat, you know, these totalitarian dictators both the same way? It's, uh, I mean, I, maybe he changes his tune later in the book. I don't know, but I think it does. It shows that I think McMeekin is either unwilling or unable to see that, you know, the opposition to Germany in the West you know, has little to do with like a principled stand against dictatorships and much more to do with, you know, wanting to eliminate and crush Germany as an industrial rival to the U.S. and the U.K. Yes, I mean, we, we've got all those countless, um, you know, early war texts, you know, Germany must perish and the like. like yep. there's, there's just this more historical uh national and ethnic element far more than any sort of principled stand against bolshevism or totalitarianism or fascism it's uh, we're, we're really beginning to see um more ethnic resentment against the germans than we are um bolshevism or anything like that yeah 
So Stalin had dodged a bullet. Even so, the signs from Helsinki were not promising. On November 3rd, yet after another encounter in the Kremlin had gone sour over the Hanko question, Molotov warned the Finnish delegates that we civilians can't seem to do any more. Now it seems to be up to the soldiers. Now it is their turn to speak, end quote. Still not ready to give up, Molotov and Stalin called the Finns one last time on November 4th. Stalin was not willing to give up Hanko, but perhaps the question could be finessed with the Finns calling the new Soviet base there a concession, a rental, an exchange, a trade, anything they want to. Still, the Finns said no. With diplomacy having broken down, it was indeed time for the soldiers to speak. But the truth was that in November 1939, neither side was ready to wage war. Having expected the Finns to come around, Stalin had issued no orders to begin invasion preparations until after talks had finally broken down on November 3rd and 4th. Excuse me. The daunting task of preparing for what was now a winter campaign fell to Kirill Merostokov, the commander of the Leningrad military district. Merostokov did his best, but time was short and was not easy to bring units up to combat strength on short notice. The most critical task would be undertaken by the strongly mechanized 7th and 13th armies, composed of nine rifle divisions, four tank brigades, and several heavy artillery re regiments. Those would advance across the Karelian Isthmus and try and break through the Mannerheim Line, a series of reinforced concrete pillboxes, log-roofed bunkers, and earthworks guarded by Finland's best troops. Meanwhile, the 8th Army, with five rifle divisions, a light tank brigade, and several more heavy artillery regiments, would advance northwest from Lake Ladoga against a second, slightly less imposing Mannerheim defensive line. Further north, the 9th Army, spearheaded by the mechanized 163rd Division, would advance westward into central Finland toward Suomalasami with the goal of cutting the country in two. Finally, the much smaller 14th Army was to coordinate an attack with the Soviet Northern Fleet on Petsamo to secure the city's critical nickel supplies and establish an Arctic perimeter against possible British naval encroachment. On paper, at least, uh, Meretskov was able to throw over a million, in practice, more like 600,000, troops into this four-pronged invasion of Finland, along with the thousands of warplanes offering close air support in Blitzkrieg-style terror of bombing Finland's cities. The overmatched Gustav Mannerheim recalled to command the Finnish defense would have less than 150,000 troops to oppose the Soviet armored invasion. Many of his soldiers were older reservists and teenagers. It's pretty heavy stuff. Yeah. Extremely. Still, however overwhelming the Soviet advantage would be in the order of battle, wars are not won on paper. As Meretskov wrote on the eve of the hostilities in late November 1939, the terrain of coming operations is split by lakes, rivers, swamps, and is almost entirely covered by forests. It was unsuitable terrain for motorized vehicles. This would likely neutralize the effectiveness of Meretskov's tanks and heavy armor, if not render them entirely superfluous. It is criminal to believe, he concluded his report with a note of realism, that our task will be easy or only like a march, as it has been told to me by officers in connection with my inspection. Then we get and a here very we go. nice map. Let me scroll up, out a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is um, this is the, the, the Finnish war, Soviet Finnish war, 1939, 1940. We have our Soviet forces, armies, and attacks. I'm going to just zoom out a little bit here. Yeah. There we go. But yeah, so we've got our armies that have been listed here from the Soviet, um, from what we were just reading. Here is our Mannerheim line. Yes. Leningrad. Yep. And then you can, if there's Leningrad, you can see how close it is to the Finnish border. And you can also see uh, Hanko there. Just off of just west and uh, south of Helsinki. That's kind of guarding the entrance to the Gulf of Finland. So you can see why Stalin was so emphatic on having control of that. And then I don't think it's as relevant to the war itself, but yeah, up at the top there, I think that shaded area is what uh, Stalin was proposing to give to the uh the Finns in exchange for yeah, the Karelian region. Areas occupied by the yeah. Soviet Union. Yes. So you've got this. We can move uh, you know, rather than up here, you know, to, we, we can mm -hmm. change the borders. We'll we'll just move it 
anywhere yeah. else. It's a less strategically important territory. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we just these... take the border and push it over there? Yeah, and we're going to take all of this. So, of course, we have our fighting all along here, but also just territory that would be occupied by the Soviets. But again, um, in incredibly uh, bloody fighting that's going to come yes. out of this. Um, and everyone likes to cite, of, of course, the, the famous sniper during this conflict. But I mean, the, the rest of this conflict is is marred by terrain. It's very slow. It's bloody. Um, a lot of inf infantry back and forth. Uh, it's it's intense stuff, especially for one army that is very undermanned and underarmed. Yes. Yeah. Anything else you want to add there? Oh uh, yeah, I guess one other thing of note in the map is you can you know you see like the, the the gray squares are uh, Soviet formations, the whites are uh, Finnish. But the legend, you know, the I think the important thing to keep in mind here is every Soviet square is an army. For the Finnish side, those white squares, that's not an army, that's a division or a corps. So that it's an entire order of magnitude smaller in force dispositions. So that gives you a much to give you an idea of how disparate the scale is here. Yeah, I mean, we just listed out that you have yeah. a, a force of around 600 to 650,000 uh, in comparison to a, a force, maybe 150,000 comprising of older men and teenagers. Yep. Um, yes. And one of these sides has already fought before, either in the mop up in Poland or has already seen some battle with respects to, to fighting and, and Kalk and Gold and others in, in 39. So one is already battle tested one is not um, yes but you know we, we've got some axes to grind and those axes are, are going to finally be swinging one of the biggest problems facing merstikov was how to motivate red army grunts training in the cold snowy wastes of karelia to fight what was plainly just a war of aggression in winter no less this was the job of the p-u-r-k-k-a or perka the Red Army's political department, headed by another Stalin, one of Stalin's hatchetmen, the former editor of Pravda, Lev um, Meklis. Meklis had overseen the agitprop side of the Red Army purges in 37 and 38. No need to do an early life check there. Um, that had um, the purges that had, was descending on the army. Simon Seabag Montefiore writes, like a galloping horse of the apocalypse. By November 1939, uh, Meklis had ruled over a vast propaganda army and propaganda army inside of the Soviet army, subjecting soldiers to several hours of ideological indoctrination um, by politrucks or political commissars, during which the men were not training with firearms or practicing combat maneuvers. On November 23rd, Melklis reported to, the, to Stalin that the 7th Army is not yet politically oriented enough. To remedy the lack of war enthusiasm, uh, Meklis report promised to mass print a new daily newspaper for the Seventh Army. Meklis also created an occupation daily called "The Voice of the Finnish People" and hired translators to churn out Finnish editions of Pravda. Meklis dispatched another trusted Stalin workhorse, the Leningrad Party boss and NKVD chieftain Andrei Sadunov, who had signed hundreds of execution lists during the Great Terror, to indoctrinate the Soviet Ninth Army, which would invade central Finland. At the center of the Soviet agitprop scheme for the Finnish invasion was a plan, cooked up by Melkis, Molotov, and Stalin, to erect a Finnish communist uh, puppet government just over the border and Terioki, 30 miles northwest of Leningrad, today's Russian Zelenogorsk, or Zelenogorsk. The idea was that this new democratic government of Finland, democratic government of Finland, uh, mm. democratic republic, huh? democratic, democratic socialism. socialism. Hmm. Mm. Anyway, it just gets the noggin joggin about um, how close we are to communism nowadays, or that we have communism. Yeah. Headed by the 58-year-old Finnish politician Otto uh, Kusinen, a Stalin stooge and a resident of Moscow since 1920. I'm going to just right click that name, search Google in another tab. <laughs> just uh, doing some real quick. Um, Cause I actually don't know that much about him. He died in 1964. Hmm. Uh, interesting. 
But yeah, uh, former Prime Minister of the Finnish Democratic Republic. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, uh, an interesting um, side story there. Um, but he would invade, uh, invite the Red Army in order to do so, add as Molotov's communique put it, to establish good relations between our countries and with united forces protect the security and inviolability of our nations. Kusinin's program for communizing Finland was dated, calling for an eight-hour workday, something Finnish workers had enjoyed for their country's entire two-decade existence, along with breaking up the great landowner estates from the czarist times, of which there were now very few left. More to the point, Kusinin's propaganda leaflets advised Finns not to shoot at the invading Russian army, but instead the White Guard government of Tanner and Mannaheim. A uh, little, little older propaganda here, a little dated. Just, yeah, a, just a tad. Just a tad, you know. A little smidgen. You would say so, yeah. But uh, alas, um, you know, again, it kind of shows you that this is this is more of a historical rivalry axe to grind than it is, um, you know, like he says, just a flat out a war of aggression. You know, we got to yeah. we got to cut the Germans off. So you know, this means, you know, Finland be damned. Yep. Other than the transparent ruse of Kusinin's expensively endowed puppet government, the Soviet invasion of Finland followed the Nazi template from Poland closely. On October 26, 1939, a border incident was arranged. Red Army gunners fired shells at the um, Manila border outpost on the Karelian Isthmus, or the Finns fired shells at the Soviet border garrison, as Molotov claimed in his protests filed with the Finnish government, believed by no one outside or indeed inside the Kremlin. It was later confirmed by neutral observers that the Finns did not even have artillery at Manila. Uh, Molotov demanded that the Finns withdraw all of their armed forces 25 kilometers behind the border with the Soviet Union, um, a demand Mannerheim refused. With Stalin's wafer-thin Casas Belli arranged, the Soviet invasion could proceed. And just another homage to Hitler's methods, there was no declaration of war. Just past dawn of November, yeah, just past dawn of November 30th, Stalin's undeclared war against Finland began with furious artillery barrage on all fronts, followed by the scream of warplanes overhead. Yeah. Did you plan to record this on November 30th, or did this just work out that way? It just worked out that way. <laughs> so we are on. Um, this is what 1939. So we are now on the. Um, 84th anniversary of the invasion of Finland. Uh, I did not plan it th this out, but uh, it worked out that way. Yes. So, yeah, during the, you know... <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I didn't even... Thank you for pointing that out. I would have been totally oblivious. <laughs> but now everyone knows which day we recorded this when this finally gets mm. released publicly. The patrons get to enjoy it later today. Uh, the only difference between the bald acts of territorial aggression in Finland and Poland was the Soviet Blitzkrieg was less efficient than the German one. The Soviet medium bombers, mostly SB-2s, dropping 1,000 kilogram payloads from cautious heights of 3,000 feet or more, were not especially accurate. In Helsinki, Russian bombers failed to knock out a single docking bay, airfield runway, Finnish warplane, or oil tank, although one airport hangar was destroyed, a stray bomb hit the Soviet legation building, and according to eyewitnesses, red fighter pilots who strafed Helsinki suburbs as well, machine gunning women and children who had fled their houses to the fields. Similar scenes of horrors were repeated in Vyborg, as well as in provincial towns such as Lati and So and Kotka. While early estimates of civilian casualties were inflated, it was later confirmed that the first two days of Soviet bombing, at least 87 Finnish civilians were killed and 270 were wounded. Can't kill any military targets, but boy, oh boy, we're really good at killing civilians. Yep. Um, Meritskov's landward assault on the Karelian Isthmus fared little better than the air campaign. During the interval between the border incident of November 26th and the Russian onslaught of early November 30th, Mannerheim had wisely evacuated most of the civilian population. A series of clever booby traps were then set for the invaders, including pipe mines, steel tubes crammed with explosives buried in snowdrifts set off by hidden tripwires. The most effective defense of all was the Molotov cocktail, first used in Spain, but ingeniously adapted, updated by the Finns, who would fill liquor bottles with a blend of gasoline or kerosene, tar, and potassium chloride. In fits of daring do, the, <laughs> the Finnish soldiers on skis would drop these into the turrets of advancing geeks, 
ram branches or crowbars into the tank treads or slice holes in the ice to sink them. At least 80 Soviet tanks were destroyed in the initial border clashes on the Isthmus, fatally slowing down Meretskov's advance before the 7th Army even reached the fortifications of the Mannerheim Line. Despite the boasts of Russian high command that the campaign would be over in 12 days, um, Klim Voroshilov was overheard saying it would take only four. By mid-December 1939, most of the Soviet 7th and 13th armies were still blundering along short of the Mannerheim Line. On December 17th, the 13th Army actually went into reverse, retreating after bloody, bloody losses in a clash at Taipei. By then, even the tiny Finnish air force of old Dutch Fokker fighters, 162 strong, had joined the rout, knocking down Soviet bombers. One Finnish ace took out six in four minutes, doing so uh, um, and doing wonders for the morale of the Finns below. Further north, the Soviet 9th Army was nearly destroyed in a battle near the burnt-out village of Sul Masalami on no, December 9th. One Finnish ski sniper, a farmer named Simo Haya, personally killed, according to legend, more than 500 Russians. This is where everyone's favorite sniper comes from. Yep. With iron sights, no less, as legends tell us. Yeah, 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 good old M39 Mosin Nagant. Can't go wrong with it. It's a great rifle. I own one. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Although I own a Soviet surplus Mosin, probably not a 39 model, but still. I uh, no, uh, no, you would uh, you would have to pay more than just a pair of kidneys to know an M39 these days. <laughs> and an M3, I don't own an M39, but I own a Mosin Nagant, and that's a great rifle. I can have my shitty kidneys if I want to get an M39, <laughs> but I, I am I am saving for something a little more practical and not as uh, recreational. Yes, yes. Uh, Fair but, enough. Alas, uh, it would be nice. It would be nice. I have two shitty kidneys. Surely that's got to be worth something. To do. <laughs> I'll, I'll go talk to my guy. Yeah. Anyways. Futures on the Oregon market. But yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 well, you know, maybe the Argentinians can give me a, a good, you know, good, give me a good fair price. All right. Soviet losses in December 1939 were positively appalling, as high as 70% in many units. Wounded Russians overwhelmed the hospitals in Leningrad. One overworked Soviet surgeon complained in early December that he was dealing with nearly 400 wounded Red Army soldiers every day. In a sign of growing alarm in the Soviet high command, Melklis suspended even carefully edited press reports from the front on December 5th. And what may not have been a coincidence, the next day the Finnish high command reported the first use of Soviet chemical weapons at the front, an episode mercifully not repeated. This is the only time that we really see chemical weapons happen um, in the Second World War. And it, with comparison to, say, the World War I fears of uh, poison gas. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, probably one of the uh, like the last sort of uh, remnants of, you know, like the, the gentleman agreements war in the 19th century is that uh, pretty much everyone involved in World War I, or in World War II, rather, agreed that the uh, they would. They don't want a, a repeat of what happened with the chlorine gas in World War One. Yeah, and again, um, a, as we would know from the Soviet archives, despite having chemical weapons bans treaties, both the United States and the Soviet Union were were breaking these rules behind their backs. Um, and I would imagine that's the case today with biological weapons and the like. Oh yes, I, I have so, no doubt. Yeah. Um, whatever policies we have for CBR and, you know, I, I, I imagine it's only 20 times worse than what it actually is in a sign of, yeah. So, um, thank, yeah, thankfully, mercifully not repeated a week later, purplish accounts in Pravda and about Kusin's, um, puppet Tereshoki government, allegedly 6,000 Finnish proletariats had volunteered to fight in his Finnish national army were abandoned as too ludicrous even for devoted communists to believe. <laughs> Meklis and Zadanov informed Stalin on December 19th that all advancing units had sustained heavy losses and that the men would need rest time, though all they were willing to grant was two days leave, barely enough time to get to Leningrad and back. By December 28th, the mood on the Isthmus was bad enough that even the commanders of the 13th Army had begun requesting leave time of six to eight days for their exhausted men. By Jan early January 1940, morale was so atrocious that Russians... Um, soldiers were deserting in droves and Melkis's Perka Agitprop commissars abandoned euphemism and began reporting the truth. In the first two weeks of 1940 alone, Stalin received 22 summary reports from the NKVD on army discipline problems. Yeah, not a great start. Not a great start. And we've got some, you know, we've got some reports on this. It's pretty rough. 
Yeah. So abysmal was the Red Army's performance that Stalin felt the need to intervene. Voroshilov took Stalin's abuse in one notorious shouting match in the Kremlin, famously toppling a platter of suckling pig before storming out, a gesture that amused the Vods enough that the Voroshilov survived as a kind of court gesture, gesture of the Soviet high command. Theater kid government, indeed. Indeed. Um, Meretskov, too, came in with furwithering criticism. The whole world is watching us, Stalin admonished him on January 7th. The authority of the Red Army is the guarantor of the security of the Soviet Union. If we get stuck in the face of such a weak opponent, that will arouse the anti-Soviet forces of imperialist circles. To assist Meretskov, uh, Stalin appointed um, Semen uh, Timoshenko, a loyal and competent career officer who had come up through the ranks, commanding a new Northwestern Army group on December 26th, 1939. With this reshuffling of the Finn command, Stalin was tacitly admitting that a real war was underway and not some protection mission launched from Leningrad to assist Kunsin's puppet government from Teryoki. The most important change came in January 1940, when Meklis and Stalin responded to cascading reports of morale problems by forming disciplinary NKVD battalions. Um, these control detachments inside each Red Army unit with powers of life and death over the soldiery. The creation of these punitive battalions made public on January 24th in order to terrorize Red Army soldiers into compliance ultimately stiffened, or at least stopped the bleeding away, of Soviet fighting morale in Finland. In, sh in the short run, through, though the practice had unfortunate effects of ex exacerbating already a frightful reputation of Stalin's regime abroad, at one place, a Swedish volunteer told a British journalist, the Russian soldiers were being driven forward like cattle with machine guns behind them, and they were stumbling forward, hiding their faces with their arms, and the Finns just mowed them down with machine guns. He said that the Finnish machine gunners were half of them in tears and just having to do it. But what could you do? You couldn't just let thousands of Russians go into the country. Many Finnish soldiers felt pity for their opponents, prodded into battle by merciless commissars. The Russians, one Finn noted, have no nurses, no doctors, no Red Cross equipment. They pour petroleum over their dead, and probably a great many wounded too, and burn them. Another Finnish soldier told a British interviewer that, It is like killing helpless children to fire on those poor Russians who are forced to fight, who are so hungry and in cold clothing. One of the prisoners said when our soldiers gave him food, what a pity I did not take my wife with me that she could also have some of this lovely food. What shall we do with all our prisoners? They need such a lot of food. What shall we wash them and clothe them and send them to America? Oh, somehow, no matter what the refugee crisis, they always manage to send them here. Yeah, look at that. Perhaps the most damning verdict on the Soviet morale came from an anecdote wildly repeated around Helsinki in which three Russians taken prisoner ask for a last meal before they are shot. The Finns say, we're not going to shoot you. So two of the prisoners said, well, at least you're going to shoot this one, <laughs> pointing to the third. He's a commissar. Um, when the Finns said no, they said, well, for heaven's sake, let us shoot him. There you go. Yeah. By January and February 1940, stories like these were pouring out of Finland, uniting the civilized world into horrified opposition as Stalin, like Hitler, stood exposed as a bald aggressor. Even in Germany, despite a press ban on, so on the Soviet invasion, public opinion was now emphatically pro-Finnish, as in Western capitals. In a fitting coda of the now-dead Popular Front, the Soviet Union was expelled from the League of Nations on December 13th, 1939. The first nation to suffer such <laughs> a disgrace. Although it's not as if the League of Nations means that much. Yeah, it means about as much as the UN does now. It sure does. As the League's general secretary caustically observed, Germany, Italy, and Japan had at least the decency to resign from the League before committing flagrant aggressions. <laughs> oh, that third... The irony is not lost. Yep. Across Europe, young men and women were mobilizing to help the Finns. Swedes and Norwegians arrived first, but they had plenty of company. Soviet spies in Bucharest reported to Stalin that Romania had mobilized on the Soviet borders, and plans were in place for mass arrests of communists. No less worrying were the intelligence reports that Turkey was mobilizing troops on the Caucasian border. In Italy, enthusiasm for the Finns was almost universal. 
Hitler's ally Mussolini, still neutral in the European conflict, had withdrawn his ambassador in Moscow, was on the verge of declaring war on the Soviet Union, offer offering the tantalizing prospect of a split in the fascist coalition. Quietly, Britain and France began to allow Italian volunteers and arms shipments to pass through their territory and ports en route to Helsinki. Nazi Germany had denied permission in, um, you know, in obedience to the Moscow Pact. Still, you almost had, well, for what good, you know, I mean, there were strong Italian fighters, obviously, in, Hitler, uh, yeah. in Mussolini's Italy, but still, um, imagine. Again, we, we get these glimpses of an alternate time. Yeah. Yes, yeah, which, uh, yeah, are almost certainly a, a better one than the one we're in now, but this is the one we deserve. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Well, God punishes the wicked, doesn't he? Oh, don't you know it? Oh, yeah. Generally pro-German Hungary, the people of which were related by kinship and language to the Finns, was also sending weapons and volunteers to Finland. By early February 1940, thousands of tons of war material from Hungary and Italy were being transshipped through France to Finland. Britain, despite its need to defend its home islands against the Luftwaffe, agreed to send several dozen fighter planes, gladiators, and long-nosed Blenheims with the promises of hurricanes to come. And gladiators are old, um, closed cockpit biplanes um, to Helsinki. Hundreds of Polish exile of Polish exile pilots were training in England, keen to strike a blow against the Russians in Finland. As Chamberlain told the War Cabinet on January 31st, 1940, events seemed to be leading the Allies towards open hostilities with Russia. The French were even more gung ho, proposing an amphibious landing at Petsamo on January 16th. Again. A, a timeline that we did not get. Yep. More dangerous still to Stalin was the sharpening morale, moral stance of the U.S. president. Roosevelt's only domestic political rival of similar stature, former President Herbert Hoover, had gotten under his skin by organizing a high-profile Finnish relief fund, which raised nearly $4 million for the plucky Finns after receiving public endorsements from 1,400 American newspapers. His blood up, Roosevelt cast aside his earlier sympathies for Soviet Russia, which had seen him purge the State Department of Anti-Communists in 1937. FDR, you traitorous bastard. Yeah, turns out the only thing, and really the only thing he liked more than communism, was uh, holding on to power, that dear little cripple of ours. God. Gimpy. Uh, rest, yes. in, re rest in piss, Gimpy. Um, yep. While careful not to alarm Stalin with formal sanctions in early January 1940, pres the president encouraged U.S. For firms working in the Soviet oil sector to recall skilled American employees from the Soviet Union, though leaving this up to their, quote, conscience and discretion. Fellow travelers, communists. Yes. All but forcing the president's hand, a resolution was introduced into the House of Representatives to withdraw the United States ambassador from Moscow and break off diplomatic relations. And it nearly passed, losing by just 108 to 105. Yep. <gasps> yeah, once again, hair's breaths away from a, a very different world. In a speech to the American Youth Congress on February 10th, Roosevelt thundered that the Soviet Union is run by a dictatorship as an absolute as any. And the world it had allied itself with another dictatorship and it had invaded a neighbor so infinitesimally small it could do no conceivable possible harm to the Soviet Union, a neighbor which seeks only to live in peace as a democracy. The president declared a moral embargo of strategic exports to Moscow, opened a $10 million credit line to Helsinki, and authorized the dispatch of 43 Brewster Buffalo fighters. Congress soon tripled this figure, committing $30 million to Finland. If the Western allies and the previously pro-Axis Hungary and Italy, along with others resentful Soviet neighbors such as Romania and Turkey, all encouraged by the burgeoning groundswell of support in the United States, ganged up against the Soviet Union, Stalin's harassed and terrorized Red Army would find itself in very serious trouble. The Vost was nothing, though, if not a political survivor. Like a caged animal, he was the most dangerous when cornered. As shown in his creation of terror battalions to machine gun his own soldiers when, if they retreated, wavered an attack or tried to surrender to the enemy, Stalin, when his back against the wall, was capable of ruthlessness that would make Hitler blush. All right. And really, this chapter just gives us a, a brutal 
depressing look at what could have been. Yes. But it does illustrate, again, that like the war in Ukraine or like our time in Vietnam or like our time in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, that if you don't know the environment and if you don't understand who you're up against and how many other international partners are willing to go up against you, um, again, uh, the, the wars are, are wars are never won on paper. Yep. And it, thirty million dollars to Finland, ten million dollar credit line, troops, arms, planes, everything. These international efforts against Russia, you know, seems kind of familiar. Yeah, um, yeah. In some respects, it's um, and I, I think there are some uh, the key differences with oh, the course. contemporary conflict. Yeah, but yeah, and again, it's. And uh, like we, uh, like I touched on earlier, it really just goes to show you can't uh, you can't let personal grievances mix with your realpolitik. Where just whatever else you might say about Stalin, he was not a good man, obviously, but you, he was he was a smooth operator on the geopolitical stage for much of what he was doing before this. But you see none of that now. You know, you you had this botched negotiations, and you had this rushed invasion with laughable propaganda and no prep time. It's just, it's almost night and day compared to how he acted here, how to how he was acting when he was much less personally invested. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like we're 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 in a position now where, again, you know, it's been. A little over 30 years since the Soviet Union fell, but we're finally getting a reassessed historiography of what had happened in this time and to see it play out the way that it almost did, but also just to see sort of this very brutally unprepared force um, against both the environment, but also a, a, a committed fighting force. You know, we're, yes. we're, we're beginning to see the cracks in the line here, but of course, you know, if you need to pull out all the stops as the next chapter we'll talk about. And um, I've got a, I've got a great guest lined up for that one because the next chapter uh, ladies and gents is on Finland, Baku and the Kite massacre. And uh, Pete Quinones will be joining me for that one. So um, important to know, but again, um, you know, we, we have these important footnotes, of course, Poland's minister in Lithuania left, left the country in protest as an act to, uh, um, uh, to peak that later would save him from falling into Stalin's hand when the Soviets occupied the country. Um, its operations, mostly printing propaganda leaflets, were paid out from a special NKVD fund um, with respects to the uh, Finnish uh, communist government. And according to German liaison officers, it was Melchus who advised Stalin on January 19th, 1940, to make the terror battalions public in order to cut off the epidemic of self-wounding, um, to shoot yourself in the hand or foot or something to be off the front. But yeah, um, really. Uh, what what are your over thought, overall thoughts on this chapter? What what notes did you take in in, in respect to this? Uh, sure. So we uh, most of my uh, timely interruptions were just me going over notes or highlights that I had uh, made in the chapter. So we've already gone over most of what I had to say implicitly. Where it was uh, you've got. Uh, where I think you just you see this like personal vendetta that Stalin has and how this uh, clouds his judgment compared to how he acted elsewhere, uh, sort of inside baseball and what was going on with Neville Chamberlain and uh, the you know internal politics in England with regards to intervening in the war against Stalin. Uh, yeah, and yeah, overall thoughts are uh, this uh, this shows uh. I think one of uh, Stalin's real blind spots or weak points is that uh, he's great when he's not invested, but once he's like, once he's able to, once he starts taking things personally, like he did in Finland, all of that sort of uh, sly fox cunning that you saw before gone in a flash. And uh, yep, yep, that's the, uh, I would say that's uh, the bulk of what I think on this. It's very, so it's a, as, is most of this book. It's a very revealing look into a often under discussed part of World War II. A absolutely. Uh, Mr. Sorokin, where can people find you? I know that you have a, a sub stack that you write some essays on. Yes. Yeah. So I'm uh, Nicholas Sorokin on Twitter. You can find me on that handle there. I'm also Nicholas Sorokin 
www.substack.com. Uh, I have a few essays published there, time permitting. Uh, once I'm a little less busy with studying, you might start seeing a couple more on there. I've got a couple outlines lined up, ready to work on as soon as I have the time. Wonderful. Well, those links will be down below in the description for our YouTube channel members, our good friends over on Substack subscribers who will get to see this a um, considerable time early along with the rest of our Stalin's War episodes as well as patron uh, exclusive essays and the like. Um, so be sure to follow our friend Mr. Sorokin both on Twitter and on Substack. Uh, he does pretty darn good work himself, and uh, I've read it. It's good stuff. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue on with the next chapter, with Kaiten Massacre. Uh, that will be covered by Mr. Pete Quinones, and then um, the, the chapter after that will be covered by our good friend Charlemagne. So stay tuned and continue on with our series of Sean McMeekin's Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. I'll see you next time.